Good evening. It's August 31st, 2023. Welcome to another one of our uh, Follow the Red String episodes. Pain and Forgiveness. I'm not a fan of clickbait titles, so let's get that out in the open. Yet, expect maybe at the end of this, it might not be what you expect from the title. But it's still very appropriate. I love stories, especially personal life stories. Uh, to coin a scriptural term, it's a witness or giving an account. And notice that this witness or giving an account is not preaching at someone. It's sharing how this God of ours has affected our lives and our examples. One of the people that I've mentioned many times here on the Dusty Feed is Skip Moen. Skip has been a valuable resource for this channel, and most of his teaching can be very stretching and paradigm challenging. This of which, of course, we love here. But one of the things that I love the most about Skip is his willingness to wear his heart on his sleeve. And he shares some of the most personal parts of his life. What I'm about to recite or read to you are postings of his on his website and the daily emails that he sends out to us. It's a multiple part story told over many months, actually closer to two years. Pain and forgiveness. It's an ongoing story. In this episode, it's just part one. Part two will be, hopefully, a candid discussion about the thoughts and ideas that are expressed during this journey. So, welcome this evening to Follow the Red String on the Dusty Feet. And before we forget, if you find these kind of podcasts useful, then click the subscribe button. The reminders are there just for you. But also, if you think that these might be useful to others too, then click the like button, because that's the way that YouTube can choose to share these to more people if they wish. Okay. Pain and Forgiveness. Breaking news, literally, June 28th, 2021. This is Sunday. If I remember correctly, five days ago, a truck and my bicycle had a brief encounter. Within two seconds, I had a broken leg, a broken hand, a banged up shoulder, and some other lacerations. I don't remember any of it. I remember riding on the bicycle, seeing the curb, and trying to stand up only to discover that it hurt so much, I couldn't even lift myself. I didn't know I had a broken leg at that point, and I never knew I had a broken hand until the doctors told me that it was broken ten hours later in the emergency room. The amazing thing is that I don't remember the actual accident at all. An Italian man driving in the car behind the truck said that I went head over heels in the air before I landing. Some memories have returned, but none of the accident itself. My mind and body went into traumatic protective mode, and basically it blocked me from feeling or even thinking what was happening. Now, my systems are starting to recover. The pain in my broken leg is still there, but it's not as intense as it was. The pain in my hand continues. It's getting stronger. I'm starting to feel the aches and the pains of all the other blows of when I hit the cement. But today, emotional hurt is taking over. My heart hurts. Today, I feel the loneliness, the helplessness, the frustration, disappointment, and the hopelessness. Day, 
the impact of all the dreams and hopes that I had for reuniting with my wife and my children, for seeing so many friends. Today, those are being crushed along with my body by the truck. Today, those are the hurts. Today, I'm living with pain that doesn't go away with more medication. I'm amazed that the body is so capable of automatically removing the memories of traumatic pain. It doesn't let it come back, although obviously I've recorded it someplace in my mind. It's too much for my body to actually bear. So it just becomes a blank spot on my memory, as though it never happened. I just woke up with all these results. But heartache? It doesn't work like that. Heartache is slow. It grows gradually like a spiritual mold. You don't even realize it's growing in the walls until one day a little hole breaks through and you see that all along you've been living with this nightmare. All along it's been infecting you. Suddenly, it overwhelms. When I was injured, I thought I would have time to study. Study my Italian and my Hebrew and generally work on various photos. But now I'm discovering that it's so exhausting just to live. To just move around the apartment. To deal with the pain. I don't feel like doing anything at all. Maybe it's emotional as well. I just want to lay in bed. And it hurts even to write this. But I need to because it's medicine for the heart. My knee, October 27th, 2021. Many of you have asked about my knee, right? I had an MRI last week and today I consulted with the surgeon. The news, it's not very good. I've got a meniscus problem. Years ago, I ruptured my ACL. In those days, that meant open surgery with screws in the knee to hold the replacement ligament in place. Over the years, this created a tunnel inside my knee. When I fractured the knee in the accident in June, the fracture went into this empty space inside my knee. As a result, there's no bone to grow back together. So, the pain I have is from the fact that the fracture can't heal properly since there's no bone where it should be. This has caused the remaining bone to be very weak. And that means knee replacement is also not an option now. I'll have to live with the pain and hopefully, over time, the bone will regenerate. But the prospects? They aren't good. I'll be wearing a brace now and taking injections to promote bone growth. And hurting. Now you know what to focus on in prayer. Basically, I need new bone growth or a miraculous recovery. Midnight pain. 11.45 p.m. 5 April 2023. Pain. 24-7. Never stops. Never. Injections, opioid drugs, therapy. Nothing makes it stop. 30 days now without relief. Every night it gets worse. No sleep. My knee aches in waves. Then, sharp, like someone has a drill bit under my kneecap. Always in the same spot. Continuously. What do you get out of this? What purpose can this serve? What do you want? You see. I believe that if you wanted to, you could stop this in an instant. Everything about the witness of 4,000 years of your people says that this doesn't happen by accident. It's not random fate that makes me suffer. No. It's you. But why? I'm sure Job must have felt the same. What's the point of making those who actually want to believe in you? 
and your goodness to suffer? If I could point to some terrible sin, then I could understand. Do I think I don't deserve this? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, I do believe that I don't deserve this. Do I think I'm innocent? No, of course not. I have plenty of guilt, more than enough to go around. But do I need a reminder, a 24-7 punishment to make me admit my sinfulness? No, I don't think so. In fact, just the opposite is occurring. I'm aware that I'm reaching the place where I might stop believing in a good God. What good does it do to believe in a God who cares, but doesn't care about me? Why hold on to the idea of benevolence when the God who could act doesn't bother to act? What does this tell me about such a God? You know, I could learn to live with this. It won't be easy. It'll change my life completely. If this is what I can expect from now on, pain management will become my reality. It already is. I'm not sure what I'll do with this going, uh, how it's going to be and how I'll live for the next 20 years. But I do know that it'll change what I believe. God of silence isn't to my God. You know, it's not hard to imagine what Holocaust survivors think about God. And sometimes I catch myself trying to reverse psychology on God. If he thinks I might lose my belief, then maybe he will act. But of course, that's just stupid. He already knows this game. He doesn't act. That's the real story. He doesn't act. He doesn't do anything to relieve this constant, continuous drilling in my knee. When he doesn't act, what am I to conclude? The thought is scary. He doesn't really care. For me, it's really pretty simple. As a father, if one of my children had this kind of painful life, I would do whatever I could to relieve it, especially if the relief depended on me. It wouldn't matter to me if my child was unworthy. That value assessment doesn't enter the equation. It's my child. It's all that matters. So it's getting harder and harder to hold on to the thought that God is a, a father when I know perfectly well that he could take this away. And he actually claims that he can. And yet, silence. How long do you think it'll be before the idea of a loving father is a mistake? A further reflection, April 10th, 2023. Job 122. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. I received numerous emails following my description of the constant pain I have in my knee. They were very encouraging, offering prayers and empathy. One in particular really touched me. It was about another person's pain. A young man who at the age of 18, he died from cancer after a long battle and excruciating complications. I thought... Who am I to complain about what I'm experiencing? My pain is nothing compared to his. Why do I think I should be so special that this shouldn't happen to me? I was ashamed that I raised any questions at all about God's involvement. And at the time, I finished reading a book. Uh, Mother Teresa, Come Be My Light, The Private Writings of the Saint of Calcutta. I learned from her personal letters that she suffered from feelings of enormous abandonment by God for more than 40 years. But in all that time, she pressed forward in obedience. You know, she wrote, Lord, my God, who am I that you should forsake me? The child of your love, and now become as one most hated the one you've thrown away as unwanted, unloved. 
I call, I cling, I want. And there is no one to answer. You know, my pain, it really doesn't matter. Oh, it's real, it's disturbing, and it's discouraging. But it doesn't compare with others. With the 18-year-old whose life was snatched away too soon. With the saint who felt rejected by God. And with Job, the righteous man who seems to have been a victim of God's love. Who am I to question what God is doing? So, I thank you deeply for your prayers and for your concern for my health. It means a lot. I'm grateful that you shared your own pain with me, for it helped me see that I'm not that important, not that special. I'm just another traveler. And at this particular time, I've been asked to carry a slightly heavier load, perhaps in order to bear someone else's burden. Painful Days, April 30th, 2023. Psalm 6-3, it's a Robert Alter translation. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am wretched. Heal me, for my limbs are stricken. My limbs. Now you will read a reflection that I wrote more than a month ago. My left knee still hurts every day, all the time. But it isn't excruciating. No wheelchair. Nevertheless, it's not normal, and for that reason I'm still in crisis mode. With that in mind, here's what I wrote when all of this was happening. By the time you read this, either one of two things will have happened. Either my left knee will have miraculously improved so that I can walk around without pain, or I'll be back in a wheelchair for the third time. I sincerely hope for the former. But today, as I write this, I'm quite frankly very afraid of the latter. I'm taking a break from our venture through Meshalit Yesharim to write about the connection between physical pain and spiritual discouragement, because that's exactly where I am today. Perhaps you'll empathize if you've also been in this dark place. As of this writing, I plan to be free to travel here in Europe. Then later, I'm going to fly to the USA to see my new grandson and the rest of my children. For months, I've been anticipating these trips. It feels like the specter of COVID has been lifted and the real excitement of moving to Europe is about to break free. You know, I'm sure that shortly after we moved here, I spent many months recuperating from the surgery on my right leg, right? A torn Achilles. Then, just as I was about to enjoy movement again, I was hit by a truck while riding my bicycle and spent the next six months learning to walk again. Broken leg, broken hand. And now, just when I feel as if I'm ready to venture into all the places that I'm so excited about, it looks as if a knee problem will put me back in that dreaded chair with wheels. And all my hopes for traveling with fall They'll fall to ruin again. Now, this might not seem like a huge battle. After all, it's just age. It's catching up with me. But for me, this is a spiritual crisis, not merely a physical one. Why? Because my hope seemed dashed in spite of my trust in a God who could fix all this in a second. I've been in so much pain that I can't sleep at night. I can barely walk to the bathroom in the apartment. All of this seems incompatible with the promises of God, and more specifically, with the belief that God is not only sovereign, but also compassionate. I think to myself, if any one of my children had this much pain and I had the power to do anything about it, I wouldn't hesitate for a moment. I consulted my rabbi. He sent me on a journey through Psalm 6, 20, 30, 41, 51, 62, 142, and 146. But the verses in Psalm 6, 
really say it all. Lord, do not chastise me in your wrath. Do not punish me in your fury. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am wretched. Heal me, for my limbs are stricken, and my life is hard stricken. And you, O oh Lord, how long? Come back, Lord. Deliver my life. Rescue me for the sake of your kindness. I don't expect him to heal me because I'm worthy. I'm not. But the unworthiness of my children wouldn't prevent me from rescuing them because my love for them isn't based on their merit. It's based on my care. I know I'm wretched, just like David. But the Hebrew is umlau. It doesn't mean a worthless sinner. It means feeble, in a state of exhaustion, withering away. That is, in fact, the condition of being in constant pain. Get to the point where all you can do is endure. Oh, yes. Modern medical science can provide painkillers. What if they don't work? Then what? Pray for sleep? But there is no sleep. The pain won't let you sleep. Exhaustion, more prayers, more tears. Pretty soon you begin to wonder, does he really care? Now it's no longer battle against a body that's screaming at you. It's a spiritual crisis. As David said, come back, Lord, deliver my life. God left. I hurt. Come back. I'm begging you. But not because I'm begging you. Come back because of your kindness. But that's the word, the Hebrew word, chesed. We didn't expect it. We thought the word would be compassion from Raham. But no, David doesn't ask God to heal him because God is compassionate. He asks God to heal him because God has a relationship with him. Chesed. Connection, obligation, reciprocity, action. Everything that matters in relationship. Uh -huh. Now you see something even deeper. As we learned yesterday from Luzado, love is a desire for the other's good in which reciprocity or mutuality is no longer a significant factor. I'm not asking God to involve himself in my desperation because it will enhance his relationship with me. That doesn't have to happen at all. God doesn't need reciprocity and mutuality to be God. He gains nothing from healing me, except my praise. That's all I can offer. I hope that's enough. By the time you read this, we will all know. Painful day. A reflection. August 29th, 2023. Yes, just a couple days ago. Psalm 6-2, Robert Alter translation. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I'm wretched. Heal me, for my limbs are stricken. My limbs. On the 30th of April, this year, right, uh, I wrote a piece about the excruciating pain I was experiencing in my left knee. I asked for your prayers. Thank you. I wrote about the spiritual crisis that accompanied the physical suffering. As you recall, the pain was nonstop, 24 hours a day for many weeks. Then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it disappeared. I made my journey to America, saw my children, took photos in a slot canyon. Since then, I've had no more problems with my left knee. Now, when I reread what I wrote at that time, I'm embarrassed, ashamed. My faith in the benevolence of Yodhe Vavhe was put to the test. I don't think I did very well. I can carry a lot of mental anguish, but during that time, the physical torture was more than I could deal with. I questioned my faith. And God. It's been about four months since I wrote that. Now, I realize that a greater crisis is upon me. 
despite the fact that I'm walking without trouble. What is that crisis? It's the shame of it all. There's a real sense that my failure to maintain my view of God's goodness makes me feel unworthy of his blessings and unable to re-engage with him. I must be such a disappointment. Here I am, scholar, teacher, believer. I've heard the cock crow three times. How can I continue to write about the sovereignty of God if I so easily questioned it in the past? How can I accept his continuing care when I've been such a disappointment? My limbs aren't stricken anymore. But my heart is. I know the theology. God, he can certainly forgive my doubting his goodness. He can forgive my complaint, my lack of trust my self-preoccupation with the desire for relief. He can forgive. Not sure how I can. When I think about my reluctance to forgive myself, then the yes or hurrah gets right to work, reminding me of all the other things that I don't deserve to be forgiven. One failure opens the door for remembering all those other failures spread across my bumpy spiritual journey. The uh, Yetzer Hurrah is a field day convincing me that God wasn't even involved in all of this, that my mysterious onset and just as mysterious belief was just some psychological abnormality. Nothing spiritual at all. And the temptation to consider it nothing more than the chaos of the universe makes me feel even worse because it essentially denies his sovereignty. Job, forgive me for even thinking I could question the whole affair. Today, I'm somewhere in the Mediterranean, enjoying accommodations and meals, simply because the company wants me to speak about things that I love to speak about. A very nice gig. Do I think I deserve this? Am I grateful to God for making it possible? Am I more grateful when my life is pleasurable? Not so grateful when it hurts? Seems so. What's that say about who I really am? Is God my Lord only when things are going well? I hope that isn't the case. But I have April 30th to remind me of how fragile my faith seems to be. So thank you all for helping me through this. You are the hands and feet and voices I needed. So that's part of Skip's life story, at least so far, as of a few days ago, anyways. You know, maybe it's with a bit of irony that just prior to these events, yeah, Skip had finished his book, Broken Bits, Poem from the Wastelands. Um, you know, we've even quoted from this quite a few poems right from that book. If you're interested, I'll put the link in the description. Pain and forgiveness. The pain, real. The need for forgiveness, real as well. But now we're talking about us forgiving ourselves. You know, I wonder where in history, and I'm compelled that at least it's an exploited thought within the Western church, that the focus on worthiness began to be a manipulative thought, shifting worthiness to unworthiness. Now, we saw with David, the unworthiness, the worthlessness, was not the wretched sinner. It's because David had a relationship with God. He is his child, chesed. And as chesed goes, worthiness, because relationship infers care. God loves. God cares. I'm not worthless to God. And the stories littered throughout Scripture attest to that. God loves. God cares. But can we see that? Maybe it's all part of His ways or not our ways and the depth of His love and how and when it'll unfold or not at times. 
within our scope to understand. I don't know. I posted an episode a couple of weeks ago in the Random Connected Thoughts series called The Opposite of Broken. I talked about my experience with the folks that are in a perpetual state of brokenness. Permanent brokenness. But that is not what I experienced. It was the opposite of broken. But I also connected with Skip. I sympathized, even empathized. I connected with the moments of the challenge of being grateful for what, whatever state I'm in, at whatever time, because I've not felt that way too. Deserving? Skip used the word. For me, it's culpable. Do I have anything to do with why I'm here at this time, with this attitude, with this perspective? I feel very much that my culpability goes further back than I probably can even remember. But make no bones, those connections are there. So in the next parts of this series, we can talk about that. And when worthlessness or unworthiness really crept into our pictures, when our value to God became corrupted, where we became convinced that we have no real value to God, it's a slippery slope. It's a rough landing at the bottom. Maybe that's a red string that I want to disconnect. Thank you for listening. Please, feel free to go to thedustybeat.com for more of these kinds of podcasts. And thanks for with us tonight with Follow the Red String on the Dusty Feet. Thank you.